Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. I have always said that if you want to change the ending to your story of your love life, you actually have to rewrite the beginning. Now, in order to do that, you have to change the script, right? So it's told in a different way. And this is how you break patterns. Otherwise, you're telling the same story over and over again and dating the same people again and again. But it is not easy. I mean, you first have to recognize it where it begins in order to then talk about it. And then of course, do something with it. Now, I mean, I've told my story many times. Some of you've heard it at nauseum. <laughs> Some of you heard it different versions, different chapters, or maybe you're hearing me for the first time, but I want to share with you a snippet of one of the first chapters in my story of what my life was like as a young seasoned therapist, as a married woman, and as a young mom. So you see, I, I love being a therapist, first of all. It was great. It was my first job. And right out of grad school, I worked in the inpatient unit at a hospital. I worked with children and families and actually some s- severe cases, homicidal and suicidal kids. And I did group and individual and family therapy. And actually, eventually I did drama therapy. I don't know if some of you know that because I had a theater background and I thought that was really powerful. And of course, then I moved into private practice. I I worked in the schools for many years, and I thought I was a good therapist. Honestly, I did. And, and I loved being a wife and playing, you know, Susie Homemaker in my humble abode with my picket fence, and, <laughs> and I experienced giving birth to my sons. And I really thought at the time, everything was perfect. It was going on as planned. And I thought I was a good therapist. So I thought. Until, dun, 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 my life shattered into pieces. And, uh, you know, those of you know me by now, my story changed. This was not supposed to be the next chapter in my mind. I mean, here I am divorced alone, having then be expected to have the energy to help others as a therapist. And I remember feeling at the time, I talk about this a lot, like, wait a second, I'm supposed to have all the answers. I'm a friggin' therapist right? Why am I not feeling better? Why can't I just go out and and date and get my life back how it was? And I would joke at the time that if anyone were to come to me for advice at that low point in my life, I would say, okay, you think you have issues? Like, let me go on the couch for a second and tell you my problems. I mean, I was kind of joking at the time, but I realized that it is exactly what I needed to do. And I started opening up to people and and sharing my story. And for so long, I, I didn't, you know, and I realized that not only healing from the sharing that I was doing, but the authenticity of being human was making me a better helper for others. And this changed the way I dated too. So I realized looking back, My first chapter wasn't so perfect. It wasn't so happy that I had made it out to be in my mind. In fact, I had attracted lopsided relationship because I never shared enough of me. And I dated that way. And I thought I had to be strong, you know, as a therapist and listen to men rather than asking for what I need and sharing my emotions. So I literally like was dating as a therapist. (laughs) So I wrote a new story by changing the beginning of how I dated the second time around. And it started with hello and, you know, dating where I would let men earn me. And yes, therapists need therapists, leaders need coaches. We all need someone to talk to. And it's hard to really see yourself and having a positive relationship with someone you can express yourself with and feel safe with is a crucial, crucial thing in order to change. So this, of course, is what I teach my clients. You all have heard me talk here, even on the live coaching podcast, and the importance of stating your needs, your truth, and infusing authenticity into connections people make so that you can change your love story. And that is why I am so, oh my God, I'm so excited to have this conversation with someone on the podcast today who knows the importance of expressing yourself to create new chapters and talking to a professional. She is... 
a fellow psychotherapist and a New York Times best-selling author of the new book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. It's fantastic. You have to check it out, which is being adapted as a television series with Eva Longoria. How exciting. In addition to her clinical practice, she writes the Atlantic Weekly's Dear Therapist advice column and contributes to the New York Times and many other publications. She is a contributing editor for The Atlantic, and she's written hundreds of articles related to psychology and culture, many of which have become viral sensations. And she is the most sought-after expert on relationships, parenting, and the hot-button mental health topics in the media, such as The Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS Early Show, CNN, NPR, and of course now the Charisma Quotient. <laughs> Welcome, Lori Gottlieb. Hi there. Hi. Oh my, I'm so Hi. happy to be here. <laughs> Me too. I'm so excited to have this conversation, especially given what you just said. I know, right? I am so happy that I wasn't the only therapist that needed help and wasn't perfect and that I, you know, like talking about all this stuff is so, it's, it's awesome. Like, I love that you wrote this book. I think it's so inspiring and not just, you know, in terms of you being a therapist or anything like that. It's just in in ways of when you talk about things, how much your life can change. So, yeah, I just love it. Well, I, cause I wondered what, what inspired you to write the book, this particular topic? It's so funny how this book came about because originally I was supposed to be writing a book about happiness (laughs) and the happiness Mm. book was literally making me miserable. It was depressing me. It was this ironic thing where every time I would sit down to write about happiness, I would get depressed. And it was because I was starting out as a therapist at that time. And I felt like the happiness book, it just, it couldn't capture the, the richness and the realness of what actually happens when people go through life, right? So the studies are one thing, but being in the trenches is a completely different thing. And you start to realize that happiness is beside the point. And what I mean by that is, I don't mean we shouldn't be happy. I mean that if you, you know, happiness as a byproduct of living a fulfilling life is a is is what we all I think aspire to. But happiness as the end goal is kind of a recipe for disaster. And so I I couldn't write this book and I was told at the time that that you know if I didn't write this book I wouldn't write another book and all this other stuff. And again, we talk about the story that that was the story that I was mm. living by. Mm-hmm. And um you know eventually I just said, you know what, screw it, I'm not going to write this book. And I'm going to bring people into the therapy room. And at first I thought, I'm going to tell the stories of these patients because I think everybody can see themselves in these four wildly different patients. But I think we could all see aspects of ourselves in these people, or we can see aspects of people that we know too. And we can learn something about ourselves through the stories of other people. But then I thought, you know what? The truth of the matter was, I was going through an upheaval in my own life at that time. And if I just presented myself as the expert up on high, um, I would be, it felt almost fraudulent that, you know, my patients were being so vulnerable. I needed to say, here's what was going on with me too, because we all struggle. Nobody is immune from struggle. So Mm -hmm. I'm the fifth patient in the book. And, um, (laughs) And so you see me as clinician, as I, as I help these four people and there are other people in the book as well. And then you see me going through my own therapy with my therapist, um, as I try to get through something that that happened in my life. Oh my God. It's so great. And it's so needed. And like, it's taking me back to my time too, like after the divorce. And I, I, I remember just kind of walking around thinking, that I had to paint a certain facade, you know, like that I was okay, that the divorce didn't really happen. Like I I don't, and I think as therapists, and I I don't know if, you know, in your training, you know, that whole notion of the tabula rasa, you know, the blank slate, like we're just supposed to be kind of reflections of, of people. Right. right? But here I am a, a person with real feelings. And when I started sharing my story with people, how much more other people opened up and found comfort in that and that there was a process, right? Yeah. It's, you know, at the beginning of, of maybe you should talk to someone. I say that my, Mm. of all my credentials, my greatest credential is that I'm a card carrying member of the human race, 
We Ugh, use our that. humanity in the room every second. We're not disclosing things about our personal lives. We're not like, hey, guess what just happened to me? But, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that we know what it's like to be a person in the world helps me to help other people with what they're going through. If, you know, I think there are these kind of these two tropes of therapists in the world. They're sort of mm-hmm. like the brick wall, you know, the one yeah. the person, what you said, the tabula rasa, right? <sighs> Nobody's right. really like that. And then there's the other, the other trope, which is like the train wreck, the hot mess, the, you know, the, the person from in treatment, right? Who's oh like crossing gosh. boundaries <laughs> and their, their life is a mess. But just because you're going through something doesn't mean you're a train wreck. It just means you're human. And so there's a big difference between the train wreck of, of in treatment, which, you know, no, no therapist I know is like that. Yeah. Um, you know, or just you're a person and, and life happens. And that's what I'm writing about in the book is what happens when, you know, you, I think we're all sort of mirrors reflecting mirrors, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like my patients are going through something. They force me to, to look at something more deeply in my own life. The fact that I'm looking at something more deeply in my own life helps me to help my patients look at something more deeply in their own life. So, you know, we kind of, we, we grow in connection with others and it's really important that people, um, that, that people don't hold things you know, like you were saying, I needed to go talk to a therapist. Hmm. And I think when we don't, we feel like we're the only ones going through this and we feel even more isolated. Yes. And I think that that's the one thing that I'm seeing in so many people that I help. And I don't know if you are too, is the loneliness that people feel and, and how that isolation prevents people from finding love, from finding opportunity, because they feel like they're somehow different. And when there's this, yeah, vulnerability and sharing, I think it just makes everyone feel, you know, a part of something, right? Like the inclusion, yeah. piece, I think is so huge. Right. Mm-hmm. right. I think when you, when you're dating and you're walking around feeling like something's wrong with you, well, you know, you're not going to be very successful at at being in a relationship because when you're in a relationship, you need to feel whole. And, um, you know, so I think that, that what happens is people, I write about, there's a woman in the book, one of the four patients that I write about, and she's in her 20s and she keeps choosing the wrong guys over mm-hmm. and over and over. And she can't see that, you know, it's her whole, her whole theory about this is that, you know, oh, men are terrible and nobody wants a relationship. And it's like, no, you're picking, (laughs) you're choosing (laughs) those guys. And in fact, at one point she even starts dating somebody from the waiting room that who has an appointment at the same time with another therapist in my suite. And Mm. she's like, well, at least he's in therapy. She thinks that's a step up. (laughs) And (laughs) <laughs> right. And it's, and, and I can see from, you know, like right there, I mean, yeah. I can take one look at the guy and be like, no, you know, this is not. And in fact, he ends up coming with his girlfriend to therapy. Right. So, you know, it's, that's what happens to her is that she keeps, she, she doesn't realize that she's enacting this story, that, mm-hmm. going back to the story. Yep. Um, and it's this faulty narrative. There's so much wrong with this story. And I was a journalist for 10 years before I became a therapist. And I still write, obviously. And I feel like a lot of what I do as a therapist is I I feel like as I'm sitting in the therapist chair, I'm almost like an editor. And Mm -hmm. I'm helping people to say, this is a, this is a draft that you brought in and it, it's, there's certain things in the draft that are good and we should keep. And there are other things in this draft that really need editing. A lot of these faulty narratives that you have, like, I'm unworthy, nothing will ever work out for me, you know, whatever, I'm unlovable, you know, whatever, whatever that narrative is. Um, and, and to help people to kind of, you know, change, change the story to something more accurate. People think that they're yeah. holding on to an accurate story, but actually they're holding on to something that makes no sense at all. I love that. And by the way, you're like an amazing writer. I love the way that you write. Well, and you. yeah, no, and it, it's really relatable. And I like, I chuckle when I read some of your stuff, but that's a good like question. So how, how can people do you like maybe one or two tips of how people can change the narrative? Because I mean, in theory, I think people think in their heads that they know they need to change, but actually doing it is another thing. Yeah. Well, the thing about change is it's so hard. Even positive change is hard because 
with change comes loss. And a lot of people don't realize that, that you think I'm going to make a positive change. So that's good. What are you talking about? Loss? What, you know, but, <laughs> but, but what we have to give up is we, we cling to the familiar. And when we change, right. we have to give up this ingrained pattern that, that even if it's, if it's miserable, <laughs> it's, it's something that's comfortable. Um, you know, it's comfortable in its familiarity. So it's comfortable for you to keep, you know, doing the same thing over and over and kind of shooting yourself in the foot and ending up in the same place because that's what you're used to. If you do something different, you're going to feel uncomfortable because you're not used to it. When this woman in the book, her name is Charlotte in the book, um, when she started dating men who could actually give her what she wanted, she was like, mm, not attracted. You know, yeah, oh, you know, I see that all like, the time. Uh, yeah. No, 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 no chemistry. <laughs> mm, no, nice guy, but you know, and it was, and by the way, these were like very attractive men, right? It was just, yeah, yeah. she, she was, she was profoundly uncomfortable with someone who was present and interested in her and, you know, um, responsible and loyal and um, emotionally generous. Um, she just, it was too close. It made her feel so mm-hmm. uncomfortable. So she had to come up with ways to kind of distance herself from these people. And then once she actually started dating someone like that, yeah. um, you know, that was like a real terror, right? Yes. <laughs> because she was, that was where the real terror came in because now it's not just like, it's like now this person is asking you to show up every day. And she wasn't used to having to show up because she felt like, you know, she was kind of replicating what she had growing up, which is her parents were sometimes very present and sometimes very absent. And that kind of yin yang of like, I don't know what I'm going to get at any moment. Those were the kinds of guys she would date. But now she has someone who's like always present and she doesn't know what to do with that. So she actually needed a lot of like, you know, what we did in therapy was I kind of coached her through, Mm -hmm. you know, these interactions with him Mm -hmm. so that she could, you know, not flee anytime she felt an uncomfortable feeling. Uh, that is awesome. Actually, I just did a podcast on the familiarity principle that you're talking about because we all do go back to what we're used to, good, bad, or indifferent. And yeah. I love that. So, I mean, really the first tip, how I see it is, you know, anything that's making you feel uncomfortable when you're trying to change, run towards it, not away from it. Cause that means it's something you probably need to do, but sitting with it is another thing. And so that's, what's so awesome about hiring a therapist like you or me or whatever, having somebody guide you through that discomfort because the natural tendency is to run or just not right. do and- it. Yeah. Yeah. And to help you to parse out, you need to be able to listen to your gut. So if something does make you uncomfortable, you need to be able Uh to distinguish between should I, you know, is this danger for real? And in which case, you know, trust your gut on that. Or is it that I'm going into a foreign country that I'm not used to, and I don't know the customs in this land yet, and I don't know the directions, and I don't know where anything is yet, but I will get used to it. It's a really nice place. I just don't know how to navigate my way through this place yet. So, you know, what is the source of the discomfort? It's really important to parse that out. So you want to make sure that you, you kind of reset you know, um, what is my gut telling me, but making sure that you're, you're trusting the right thing, that you're not going back to, oh, this feels scary because I'm not used to it versus this feels scary because this guy's bad news. That's a really good distinction because that trust factor is exactly, especially if you've been in like an unpredictable environment growing up, you don't know what to trust. So it's easy yeah. to just stay stuck, you know, or, or just stay where you are, you know, even though that that's more toxic sometimes than, than moving towards it. So, yeah. So I love that, you know, doing something uncomfortable, you know, knowing the source of the discomfort, listening to your gut and then resetting it so that you can trust it. That's awesome. No, I love that. Um, you know, I, cause I be beyond that, I think there's a lot of, um, people who find, and it relates to the whole, like talking to somebody, like, do you have tips for people to feel safe in talking to someone? Cause I know a lot of times, yeah. yeah, they don't know, like if they can trust that person, you know, as you were talking about trust, I was thinking of that. Yeah, that's such a good question because, um, I think that some people mistake TMI for intimacy. Yes. Oh my God. I just, I say that all the time. It's so funny. Yes. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like this, this, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, this, these Instagram posts, 
that, you know, they seem like they're incredibly vulnerable and you know, but no, that's not, that's, that's it's not, it's that's, TMI. that's not intimacy <laughs> at all. You know, oh. we don't need to know your, your inner, you know, that's public. Mm-hmm. We're talking about relationship. Relationship is, is what happens in the energetically between two people, right? It doesn't happen on a screen for thousands of people. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, trust and, and how to reveal yourself, it's a process. Um, yeah. it's, it's, you know, people, people kind of go one of two ways on this. Sometimes pe- people who don't, you know, who have sort of, you know, not a lot of experience in healthy relationships, they either reveal nothing at all. And they, you know, they kind of, yep. they're, they're like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to reveal anything. And it's almost performative what they do. They're kind of performing, right? Like, here's, here's the, the, the image that I want to, here's a part of me that I really like that I want you to see, but I'm not going to let you see the rest of me because I feel a lot of shame around it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that. And that, and then the person can't get close to you. And eventually they get bored with you because there's no mm-hmm. there there. Yeah. In fact, wait, I just want to add that because I see this all the time with my clients. I call it shape shifting, you know, like where Mm. they're, they're dating like that. So they're, they're showing the guy or the girl of what they know that that person wants to see because they've either been reinforced for it or whatever have you. But then in the long run, that that person gets bored, like you said, and they really can't get a handle or feel for that person. So it, the intimacy never happens because of what That's you're right. just saying. Yeah. And yeah. if you're with somebody who wants to be in a, in a real relationship, um, you know, that person is going to be eventually frustrated because they're going to feel like, well, I don't, I, there's not, I can't really get under there with this person. I can't get in there yes. with this person. I want to really get to know this person. Right. So, so there's that, there's that person on the other end of the spectrum is the person who's like, Hey, first date, let me tell you about my childhood. You know, <laughs> and, um, and, and those people, right. that's not intimacy. That's like, that's like downloading your, your trauma, you know, right. um, nobody right. wants their trauma downloaded. Nobody wants somebody else's trauma downloaded on them or their problems or their issues downloaded in the beginning. Right. So it's not that you have to hide anything. And I think people, they have so much trouble understanding the distinction between being authentic mm-hmm. versus, um, you know, revealing everything, every single thing about yourself before you have that level of intimacy with that person. Yeah. Um, and so I think what happens is, especially with the way that people date so quickly nowadays with the apps and all of that, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of like you meet, um, people, some people want to have this like immediate intimacy with somebody else. And that's not intimacy. That's, that's just a lot of information about a stranger. <laughs> um, 100%. And, I so agree with this. Yeah. So, so I think that when, when, when people are dating, it's really important to just, you know, you want to just on a first date have an organic conversation, even though sometimes these conversations are a little awkward because remember, this is a stranger. People expect mm-hmm. that if it's the right person, that they're just, everything's going to flow and it's going to be really natural. And you guys are strangers. And sometimes it flows really easily, very quickly. And sometimes it takes a few dates before you guys are really kind of get in that flow. Um, But you just, you know, you want to kind of just have a nice organic conversation and you're probably not going to reveal your innermost um, private things to someone, you know, in that early time. It just, it's not organic to the conversation. Yeah. What you're talking about and what so many people get confused about is the vulnerability piece. Cause I mean, I think this word authenticity and vulnerability has been thrown around so much. And to your point, it's Instagrammable. It's like hashtag vulnerability, you know, like, but nobody really <laughs> kind of gets that when it comes to, you know, the dating thing and going back to like, I think we kind of segued into the dating thing when we were talking about how to feel safe in talking to a therapist, you know, like, the stuff that you would talk to a therapist is definitely different than what you would talk about on a date. Right. So right. Right. Different levels. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I also think, I think about in, in the book, you know, when we talk about um, being in relationship with other people, um, I think about two of the other people that I write about. And one of them is this woman who 
um, she she's in a very happy marriage and, and she goes on her honeymoon and she comes back and she finds out that she, she thought she was pregnant, but she actually has cancer. And, and it, her she and her husband go through this incredibly intimate experience together. It's really sad. But at the same mm-hmm. time, if they hadn't had that, that foundation of their relationship of being real with each other, knowing who the other person was, mm-hmm. they would have gone through this experience so differently. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think that when people are dating, they forget about what is it going to be like to be married to this person? Because yeah. I don't think that Julie in the book, I don't think that she and her husband ever thought, well, you know, we're going to be in our thirties and deal with cancer. Right? Um, right. But they had the foundation there. And so when you're dating, you know, is this the person you're going to want to go through the joys and the tragedies and everything else with? Um, how do you guys show up for each other? And they did have that. and. I think that's so important for people to remember that you're going to, this is a person who's going to be like your person <laughs> and, yes. and you, you want to make sure that you choose well in terms of, um, you know, how well you guys kind of navigate the ups and downs of life together. And that's where the authenticity and the vulnerability comes in too. Yeah. And good communication. You know, it's funny. I was talking to a client yesterday who I'm so happy for her, you know, since working together, she, she's in this great relationship. She's so excited. She's very attracted to him, different than any of her other stories, you know, around the mm-hmm. men that she's dated, but she's like, Kim, I don't know what to do this, it's just, there's something weird about our sex life. And it's like, he doesn't want to have sex with me. And she had all these stories in her head swimming. And she's like, do you think it's this? Do you think it's that? She literally was spending all this time going over like different stories in her head, what it could be. And I simply said to her, have you asked him? Ask him. him. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Like, I mean, you and I, it's so obvious, but to her, she just kind of paused and like, oh, well, no, I guess I just didn't want to rock the boat, you know? And that's what the boat's already rocked. Not having sex. (laughs) Not only that, like you are overboard and drowning at this point because, you know, and you're spending so much energy treading the friggin' waters that think about how much easier it would be if you actually just asked, <laughs> you know, and she's like, Oh my God, you're right. So we, we practiced and we role played how she can ask and use her feelings, the I feel message to convey that because she's not also used to that. She was used to pacifying, you know, people. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is so important in the foundation for relationships, dating, all of it. And with your therapist, you know, just coming clean. So I wanted to ask, um, and this is just kind of the, the wrap up question, because I think I'm sure you're seeing things. Are there common themes you're seeing that people are coming to you or even like inspirational stories from your book in regards to their love life? That's something that's more current today that you're seeing more so than at other times. Yeah, definitely. Um, (laughs) You know, I had a patient, I write about this in the book where she's telling me about like the kind of a, um, how, how they're, she and the guy she was dating were having some trouble and maybe they were going to break up. And she's Mm -hmm. like, she has her thumbs up in the air and she goes, and then he said, and then she, her thumbs up go in the air again. And then I said, (laughs) and I said, wait a minute, you had this conversation on text. And she's like, yeah. And I said, (laughs) said, how, how can you have this conversation on text? You can't, there's no feel for like, they can't read your emotions. They can't see your face. There's no body language. And she said, Without missing a beat, she said, oh, no, we used emojis, too. Oh, right. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. And, and by the way, this is like a smart, sophisticated young woman, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Um, so, and I don't mean, I know I sound like a complete old fogey when I say that, right? But the point is, there is something so differently you know, something plays out so differently when you're having a conversation face to face in the room with somebody. It's a completely different conversation. Mm-hmm. Nobody's hiding. You're both there. You both have more compassion for each other. The conversation will go better because you're not like these like bits and bytes on a screen, you know, pixels on a screen or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're real human beings when you are saying what you're saying to each other because you're sitting there a foot from each other. You might be holding hands. You're, you're on the couch together, wherever you are. And you're having this this difficult conversation and it will go so much better and probably have a much better ending because 
you're going to feel so much for that other human being sitting next to you that when you're disembodied, like just sitting there with your phone, you might say things you regret. You might not be as kind. Um, you know, you might not hear them in a way in which their sentiment was intended. Um, you might misinterpret something. Mm -hmm. So I think that yep. it's really important that people have relationships face to face. Oh and my God. Yes. Yes. Wait, you're, and you're and, not dating on your phone. And no, but this is the thing that I'm seeing too, you know, to your point and just segueing off of that, like in the dating world and just like the first impression stage, right? So that people are numbing out almost and swiping as they're, <laughs> it's almost like yeah. an addiction and, and it's, it, it actually taps into the same part of the brain as some addictive behaviors too. And, you know, like with the slot machines in Vegas, they, they actually found that it's the same kind of addiction patterns as the swiping, but because it is. of and right, that people yeah, are losing I, social skills. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I, I see so many women in my practice who um, they spend so much time once they, you know, make a connection on an app, there's so much like random texting going on. They're not even meeting. It's like, Hey, Hey, right. you know, right. like, that, like that's what's happening. You know, what, what, what do you, hey. you do? Um, you know, and, and like, they're going back and forth. I'm like, go get in a room with this person. And if he doesn't want to get in a room with you or she doesn't want to get in a room with you, move on. You know, like, what are you wasting your time doing? You can simply say, hey, let's go get a coffee. And if they like don't respond or they're like, I'm not sure I can't meet for three weeks. You know, it's like, move on. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a waste of oh your my time. God. It's so much so, and this could honestly be a whole other podcast. I'll have to have you on again, just to probably talk about this stuff, because this, what ends up happening is that, yeah, that's great in theory. And then I'll have people go out and about, but then it's the now what? Well, here I am socially body to body, face to face, but now what? How do, how, I don't even know how to talk to this person. I don't know how to flirt, you know? And right. so- Right. Oh my gosh. So one of the people right. in the book is this woman who is- um, She's about to turn 70 and mm. she, and she's dating because she's, she's divorced and, and she had some bad experiences in, in, you know, earlier marriage and she, um, she's on the apps and, you know, she's never, you know, she, this is not her generation. Right? Yes, yes. And, and it's, and it's so, it's so interesting because she's the one actually who has these, she's so ashamed of her past and certain things that have happened in, in her life. Mm -hmm. And she finally meets this guy, not on an app, by the way, in her apartment building. And she meets this guy and she doesn't want to tell him the truth of who she is. Uh -huh. And she can't, she can't reveal herself to him. She can't come to tell him. And it ends up causing them to, to kind of break up. And then she finally writes him a letter and she tells him, all this stuff and she thinks he'll never, you know, he'll never want to be involved with her, mm. but he does. And it is something, you know, it is a lot for him to absorb, but, wow. but it brings them, it bring it brings them to a different level together. And so I think that one thing that happens is, you know, with all this, like, you know, the apps and the quick dates and the quick mm. assessments is that it takes time to get to know somebody. And I don't yeah. mean waste a lot of time, but I mean, just consider the fact that there, there's a real multifaceted human being sitting across from you and you are a multifaceted human being and that, you know, give the other person the benefit of the doubt when you're first meeting. I, if you're not attracted, you're not attracted. Don't waste your time. But, you know, just get to know people a little bit before you start going back. It's no, people think, well, there, I have so many options. I'll just go home and get back on the app. Are yeah. you really succeeding on the apps? Are you really finding a relationship? You know, because maybe that relationship was right in front of you. Maybe not, but just consider that. Oh my God. It's so funny because yesterday I was talking to a woman who she said that exact thing. She's like, well, I don't want to waste time. She used those words exactly. So I don't want to waste time. I said, do you realize that by you swiping people away and not giving people time, you are wasting time. So in your efforts of not wasting time, you're wasting time because you're 35 years old and you have never even kissed a boy. <laughs> you know, like, she was like, oh my God, you're right. Like she didn't realize that she thought she was being efficient yet she wasn't giving enough time for that connection. And I think the bottom line, Lori, with everything that we're talking about, maybe you should just talk to someone. 
(laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know, the title of the book is interesting. It's maybe you should talk to someone. And I don't necessarily mean a therapist, although, you know, of course, I I think that people benefit from therapy. But Mm -hmm. I just mean that we need to talk more to each other and, and, Really, um, you know, not hide, not hide and feel like we're different or something's wrong with us or whatever. But I think we need to just be more, we need to show up more. That's what I mean by maybe you should talk to someone. We need to show up more. Oh my God. Well, I was going to ask for your parting words of wisdom, but that was wisdom right there. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. How can everyone find you and your book? Um, they can find my book um, anywhere books are sold, Amazon, mm-hmm. independent booksellers, everywhere. Um, they can uh, find me on Twitter at Lori Gottlieb one. They could find me on Instagram at Lori Gottlieb underscore author. They can find me on Facebook. Um, they can find me at my website, which is Lori Gottlieb.com. She's literally everywhere. Like you cannot miss her. And I'll put a link in the, in the show description as well. Well, Lori, thank you so much for coming on. I loved our conversation. It was awesome. Oh, thanks so much. It was great. <laughs> Thanks. And of course, this has been the Charisma Quotient, and I'm your host, Kim Seltzer. Remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And if you want to know more, of course, go to my site, seltzerstyle.com. And you definitely want to check out Lori's book, Maybe You Should Talk With Someone. It is so uplifting, relatable, inspiring, all the things she was talking about. And to take it one step further, and you are looking to talk with someone yourself and change your love story, sign up for a personalized breakthrough call with me, which you can book right here on my calendar link. Of course, I'll put that in the show description as well. And stay tuned until next week with more tips on how to feel and look fabulous every day.